we will continue on the journey for creating server-based web applications. Yes, and uh, today we're going to talk about access control. Yes, and um, let's look at the content for today. Uh, we will discuss the concepts of Authentic authentication. Uh, yes, and authorization. Uh, and as we have done before, we will uh, also make or show an implementation of um, password handling, and we will show yeah. that in 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 Node Express applications. Yeah. Uh, so after this lecture, you should be able to create a simple web application, uh, server side web application with authentication authorization. Mm. Um, and basically loaded. being able yeah. to have the, the user logged in uh, on, on your application. Uh, but, I mean, this but, topic... Um, well, we, we, we won't uh, discuss all things that is important. For example, HTTPS. No, we will get back to that. Uh, because when using or when working with user authentication uh, uh, um, um, uh, things with the user's uh, password and handling user password and, and user data it's really important to do it correct mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and maybe the first thing that you actually should think about this is is this something we should handle at all and mm -hmm. other other possibilities uh, but we will look at that uh, so first of all access control why do we need access control well um, in many web applications, we we need to know who the user is. We need some kind of account. It could be a, a web shop or, or anything in, in like that, that we want to track the user over a, a period of time. And, and then we need the user to be able to log in on our applications in, in most cases. Um, we will, uh, or you always, consider access control from two points of views. We have the authorization and we have the authentication. Mm -hmm. um, the authentication is uh, what we will start discussing and then we will uh, go to authorization. So authentication is basically verifying the user's identity in some way and, mm -hmm. and making sure that the user is um, who the user is. Uh, and, and in the next step, we will look at uh, authorization, and that is more like making the user uh, permitted to access certain uh, resources in, in the application or, or, or stop the user from, from uh, um, handling those resources. Uh, oh, I forgot to, to add that one so you can see something. Well, this is the one. Um, And we, when it comes to authentication, we can do the authentication in many different ways. Uh, the most classical and probably most widely used is the cookie-based authentication, the classic cookie-based authentication. You will probably almost be able to guess how this works because we talked about sessions before. And this is basically having the session ID in a cookie and just validating this session ID and looking in our database or wherever and, and, and finding that the, the user that matched this session ID. Uh, there are other ways of, of doing authentication. We can do it using a token-based authentication mm -hmm. as well. Uh, JSON Web Tokens or JOTS uh, is one very common uh, way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, the information might, might not be stored in, in, in a data store, it's, it's embedded in this token uh, and, in, and encrypted and, uh, token. In uh, the assignment, the third assignment, I think, are we going to use that? Oh, that is a good question. Mm. I'm not sure actually, so, no. so I will mm. not say anything about that, but that might actually be, be so. At least we will, in the third assignment, use the third party access. Yeah, that that that's I true. know. Um, so the third party access being the third option in this case is that, uh, and, and this is pr something that you are probably familiar with as well, but that is uh, authenticating the user using a third party um, uh, uh, service like Facebook or something using OAuth. 
Um, we have uh, different techniques for this, Open ID Connect or SAML, uh, uh, SAML being used for, for LNU.se, for mm -hmm. instance, where, where you are logged in using uh, 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 your, your, your identity, but, but this is, is identified through a SAML uh, server. Um, we will focus in this one on the uh, cookie-based yep. one, uh, and we might get back to, to the token-based later on. Um, I mean, when, when we do this, we, we need to, 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 to have like a, a workflow. So we will look at the workflow mm -hmm. of how to, to, to authenticate the user using this cookie-based scheme. And this is, this is how it's done, I mean, not just in Node Express. Nope. This is like well, the common scheme for doing yeah. this. Well, you need to register the user, and you need to authenticate the user, and you need to authorize the, the request the user do. Yeah. So three different parts. Yeah. Start off with, OK, so we have the client, uh, and we have the server. Uh, and we have some kind of session, session storage where we can store information about this user mm. uh, and match that to a session ID. So the first thing that's happened is 1A. So uh, we have probably a form mm. on, on, on the, the, um, the web page with uh, add a username and password. And when the user has filled this in, we will send the username and the password to the server. Yeah. There might be just, just uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the, this is this is the really classical way of doing it, yeah. having a username and a password yeah. field. Um, what we can see now is a trend of migrating this common pattern to a more step-by-step uh, uh, -step pattern where the user will first of all enter its username and click next. Mm. And then it will uh, have to, to enter its password and, and press next. And this is because of uh, many services or, or web applications using many different authentication methods. So, so, so in many cases, based on your username, you will be sent a personal uh, uh, authentication method. So, so, so say that you are, for instance, I think all the students, I think it works like this for, for the students at least. I can't I, I can try since, since I don't have a student account. But if you, if you for instance, go to, to, to Google G Gmail uh, and uh, as a student enter your email address, the LNU email address, then Gmail should not authenticate that request uh, by, by, by Google service, it should send that request to the SAML service at, at the university and make the university do the authentication and, 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 and tell Google that, okay, fine, this, this user is authenticated. Uh, and, and that is why you need this kind of solutions. Um, it, it's a hazard if you have a, a mm -hmm. password management system because mm -hmm. they are pretty bad at handling that mm -hmm. right now, but it will probably be better. But for, for, for simple sake, we say that we have a form on the web page with a username and password field and the user mm -hmm. and will fill in this information. So when we look up here, well, this one, is... One more thing to mention maybe is that this flow doesn't include two-factor authentication. No, no. And we will get back to two-factor mm -hmm. authentication as well. Worth mentioning, this is kind of a, a, a part of the header that we are looking at. Yeah. Uh, worth noting, noticing is even if the, the user set, writes this password, it will be blocked out for, for the view when, when you look at it with black dots or anything. But, but I mean, it's sent in clear text inside of the header. Uh, and that's why it's really important that this is happening over a, a, a encrypted uh, connection mm -hmm. uh, using HTTPS, for instance. Uh, so we post this to, for instance, register at the web server. Uh, what the server does in this case is that it will hash the password. We will get into this in more detail, but it will hash the password and store it, uh, the username and the password in its database. Um, so in the database, we will have the, 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 the username and the password be, uh, hashed and stored away. Uh, then, uh, um, the, uh, uh, we do a PRG, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so we, we we are sending it for you to to the login page, uh, uh, 
why do we have this? Oh, this is register, of course. Yeah. This is not mm -hmm. the login. This is register, the, the user, first of all. We need to register the user. Uh, so, so we register the user. Should we log in the user automatically? I don't think so. Why but not? That, well, well, it, it's... Um, well, what, how, how to say it, but um, there are two different opinions here, I think. And the most common is that you redirect. Mm. Uh, in some cases, you you will be logged on when you register, but I don't think that's a, a, the way to do it because uh, I think it's it's important for a user to to confirm that your credentials are the that, correct ones. Yes. And, yeah. 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 And there is also one thing is in this world, when this happens, when the user gets registered, we will probably, in many cases, if we do this all standalone, we will probably want to verify the email address as well. Yeah, but but that, that is out of this, this chart for now. Okay, so we do a redirect, so we get the PRG pattern uh, to the client. Uh, and, uh, and we set a cookie. We set a cookie as well mm -hmm. on the server with a session ID, and that is because we need to... Uh, uh, Probably shows shows some some kind of message yeah. that this went went well and and you have a registered please log in. Uh, we are redirected to the login form and now the user posts its uh, username and password once again. Uh, gets to the server and now the server needs to validate uh, this uh, those cre credentials. So the server will once again look in the, look in the beta database and see if the password and the username match. If it does. Uh, then the user is authenticated and uh, we will set a, oh, and that one is green, so that means something, I guess. But we set another cookie that yeah. the user is now logged well, that, in. That's the, that's, that's the thing, it's another cookie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's not the same one, that's no. why it's green. Yeah. As it says in the text for 2B, it's regenerated. Yeah. Uh, if for some reason it, it fails that the username or password don't match up, then we will get a, a status code of 404, 401 back telling yeah. you are basically given the wrong credentials. We will not tell the user in the flash message that it was the password or the username that was incorrect. Nope. We just say that the credentials were incorrect. And, and that is important because if, if, you, if you tell the client that the password was incorrect, then you basically tell the client that, okay, so this user is actually in the database. And, and that is valuable information when it comes to trying to, to find a vulnerability in this, this application. So never tell if the username or password is the uh, incorrect one. Always say that the credentials are, are false. Um, well, you can, you can choose to, to send back a 401 or a message or flash message, yeah. for example. But yeah, we could take a look, closer look at that. Yeah, later on. So if everything was okay, we do yet another uh, PRG uh, post redirect yeah. get, uh, and that is because otherwise we will. Well, would be it says the root here, but yeah. some member area or yeah, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Uh, then the user will get something, a protected resource, for, for instance, mm. uh, 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 shown by slash protected. So the user enters that area. It will send its credential cookie or its cookie together uh, with that request to the server. The server will once again validate this uh, 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 session uh, and see that it's a correct session, that it's not uh, logged out or anything mm. like that. And if it's uh, everything is okay and the user has uh, clearance to, to access this uh, protected area, we will respond with a 200 okay. And, yeah. um, and the content, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, in this case, if it's not granted, we will send back a 403. Oh, yeah, it's hard to see because you're in the way. But yeah. Yeah, you have the slides on, on, on the course webpage if you, if you want to take a closer look. But we are sending back a 403 and that is all... Uh, all unauthorized right yeah um, or forbidden yeah uh, and we I'm not sure if we're going to have this debate right now but <laughs> it, it, are you supposed to tell the client that you don't have access to this information or should should you just tell the client that this this resource is not found well, for depends on who you ask I think yeah uh, so 
either you send back a 403 or a 404. Mm. And, the, uh, and, the, and the reason why you would like maybe to send a 404 is that you will tell less about the, 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 the infrastructure of this application. Sending a 403 will indicate that there actually is the resource that you're looking for is actually available, but it's not for you to, to look at. Mm. For instance, another member's profile uh, page or, or, or something like that, or that person's member area. Then you know that there is probably a person called this. Mm. So, uh, if you're just sending a 404 back, you will not indicate if this person actually is a member or not on, on, on in this application. Mm. So, so this is up for discussion and, yeah. and there are different views. But if, if we take the HTTP view of, of things, mm. then you should most definitely send back a 403. Yep. If we take the security uh, hat on, you should probably send a 404. So, but but that, that is up for debate. Uh, and this is basically the 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 the, the, the scheme for, for doing this. Um, okay. Well, um, we need to secure everything, right? Yeah. And where to start? Well, with the user, I think. Yeah. Uh, and now we need to, to look at ourselves uh, or go to ourselves how, how we behave as users mm. when when entering passwords and and what we as a uh, a developer should should force the user to do when mm. it comes to password, uh, and 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 this is also an area where you can have a strong opinion. <laughs> I have a strong opinion on this one. Uh, not everybody will agree with me, but I I, I think that a majority will. But uh, well, well, let's see. So first of all, you you made uh, you you add you made an addition, late addition to this, and you yeah. said that you should use a passphrase instead of password, yeah. and and it's actually. Pretty. I mean, the term the term password is so deeply ingrained in us. Yeah. But actually, it would be better if we instead of using password as well. As a, the bad part of password is word. word. <laughs> yeah, because that leads the user maybe to think that you should only use a word. Or you can. Yeah. Or you can. But but I mean, we should communicate that to the user that make the user choose a long password yeah. because it's the length of the password that matters. Um, a good way of doing that could be like uh, just showing, like you have probably seen that when you register an account that you get a bar of, oh, your password is strong or your password is weak. Mm -hmm. and, and you can have a service like that, just telling the user and, and uh, encouraging the user to, 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 to pick a strong password. Um, now we get into to, to something more, I mean, talking about per password. The second, the second thing in, in this one, never ever use the same password on multiple sites. Nope. And I mean, that is just a common rule for using password as a citizen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody should have different passwords on, on all sites, but we know that is not the case. Many reduces the passwords. Mm -hmm. You do? Yes. Yeah. I. Don't actually. Well, but it depends on the site. Yeah, I think yeah. there are sites that I'm more secret about yeah. than others. Yeah, yeah. But but in general, <laughs> you should always pick different passwords for different sites. And, well, and and I, I, I can I, talk I, for now about for, this, for, for myself. I, yeah. I think I've got a public password. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you are <laughs> you I, use I, on 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 scrap sites yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah, I probably have something like that as well. Uh, however, on all the sites where I actually create account for myself, I have have, have uh, uh, unique passwords. And this is why is it first of all why is it important to have unique passwords for multiple sites? Well, if a site is compromised, if the, if this if a site is using a bad security, not like you will do in this assignment <laughs> because you will do this correct, but but if for instance the password that the user uh, enters when registering is stored in clear text on, on a database, for instance, and that database is compromised, then your email address and, and that password, that combination is public knowledge. Mm. Uh, that means that your password and, and email is circulating on the web in different databases and people will use those to try to gain access to other sites. So if you are using the same combination on another site, you will most likely uh, use a user finding from the first source 
finding your uh, uh, credentials will be able to log into that other site. And that might or might not be a problem. If that other site is just a scrappy site, mm. might not even matter if someone else can log in with your credentials. However, if that site is your email, for instance, then you're in big trouble because then that uh, attacker has your email under control. And if they have your email, they can reset passwords for all other sites that you mm. have access to. Uh, if we forgot about two-factor authentication for a little bit, that, that's the case. So, so in that case, they will probably be able to, for instance, gain access to Facebook. Uh, and if they get access to your Facebook, they can start doing really scary stuff. And this is, I mean, for, 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 for you that's taking this course, I think it's a more serious problem if you are reusing your password than if, say, if someone in your family or... or, or or in, that is not a computer scientist is using the same password. Because what will happen is that since you have a lot, lot of clout in, in, in your uh, personal uh, surroundings so, uh, regarding computer computers and so on, your friends and family probably trust the word that you say. If you s tell them to do something regarding IT, they will probably do it because you know your shit. Uh, so what happens is that if you lose your password to your mail and an attacker get an uh, opportunity to get to your Facebook, they will be able to, to read your uh, messages, for instance, on, on uh, Facebook Messenger, and they might be able to see mimic your language and, so, and mimic how you write. Some kind of social hacking. Yeah, maybe. And and you might not even know that they have access to your, your account. Uh, they will wait for the correct moment when you travel abroad, for instance, and then they will send a, a nice message to your mother or father saying, oh, I'm, uh, I need, uh, I, I forgot my my password to, to the bank or my, my uh, do sign in Swedish, my, my, <laughs> my keypad for my bank at home. C -c -can, can I use yours? Uh, of course, that, that doesn't work. But since you are the one telling them that you can use their uh, um, keypad, they will probably trust you but it's not you. And then they, they will be able to, to like send money from their account and, and things like that. So, 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 so I would argue that you as a computer scientist has a bigger uh, risk of, it's a bigger risk and you are actually, it's like the vaccine. If you're not vaccinated, you, you, you risk the, the people in your surroundings. It's the same thing with you. If you have a bad password uh, policy, you will risk the surroundings. You will risk your friends' uh, integrity and, and your family's integrity. So I would urge you to, to, to start using the policy of never having the same password on any site. And as a computer scientist, you will set up multiple and multiple of servers and mm. be, be on a lot of services. Uh, and and, and you, you cannot you remember all the passwords, of course, and we, we, we will... We probably have something about that. Yeah, the fourth dot here that you should you should probably start using a password manager because you will need to have unique passwords for every site and you need a way of organizing this. So please start using a, a password manager if you haven't. I mean, there are many out there like LastPass, OnePassword, um, and many more. Uh, but 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 start using a controlled way of storing your passwords. The, um, that is. Uh, something you should do if you haven't already. I, I guess I assume that the ma majority of you already do this. I think I have... Well, what about the third point then? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay. Yeah, just to round off the, 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 the password manager. I mean, I think I have around a thousand unique mm -hmm. password passwords. It's quite hard for me to remember mm -hmm. them. So, of yep. course, I'm using a password manager. And how uh, long are they? Uh, I actually, I, 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 I'm, I'm, so, my, the <laughs> length that I use, is it's, it's a cr crazy long. It doesn't matter, really. I could use a lot less. However, there is a pedagogical use why I do as I do. I have a hundred mm -hmm. characters. And that's one, to test the site that I'm mm -hmm. logging into, because I think that you should be able to have a hundred uh, yeah. You should be able to enter a passphrase that is a hundred characters. 
now it's not stored as 100 characters in the mm -hmm. database and that's why it doesn't matter if it's 100 or like 30. Um, and I do that as well because that forces me to not... Try to remember them. Try to remember <laughs> them and to like logging in manually on yeah, things. Yeah. So, 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 so if I come to a place and I'm should be should enter my credentials on on this crazy library computer. I, I will not be able to do that because I have a hundred characters <laughs> random. I, I will not be be be. be I, I I need to leave. I need to do something else. I can't yes. handle that situation. So uh, so that's why I do that. But but at least as you you've written here, a password should be at least ten characters long. Yeah. Uh, and and of course for each character you add in a brute force attack, you mm. will increase the uh, um, the difficulty uh, you know, exponential. That's the most important part of the password. It's the length. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if you have special, special characters, characters, digits, and no, so on. No. It, it's, it's the length of the password that's is most important. And uh, well, that's and that's why you should use a passphrase instead of, instead of a password. Yeah. Yeah and yeah uh, yeah I mean if you need to remember it yeah then you should like my cow is drinking a blueberry soup uh, yeah. at the cafe that's mm. a good password that, I mean I you so. will probably be able to remember it as well uh, never use that one now but that's <laughs> obvious um, but I would if we if we look at you as a developer okay we can have the last one as well never give an honest answer to password yeah so so in this is also you as a citizen using services. Many services has like this way of restoring your password that you should write your favorite pet's name or you should write your mother's birthday or something like that. If, if, if you are asked for that kind of questions, do the same thing, treat that as a password. Just, just create a random passphrase, enter that in that field and, and uh, have that passphrase together mm. with the, the password in your password manager or, or handle it in, in some other way. Now then, yeah. two-factor authentication. Okay, we, we <laughs> skip that one. So, okay, two-factor authentication. Uh, this is gaining ground, uh, mm. ha has done so for, for quite a few years. Uh, and that is basically that instead of just knowing the password, we need another factor as well. Yeah. And that factor is often, uh, in many cases, your mobile phone in, in some way or another. Mm. If we go back uh, a few years, it was often a keypad, for instance, for, for at least Swedish banks. Mm. Um, but, but now the, the, the phone has, has taken that uh, um, uh, responsibility. And, and then mm. in Sweden, it's BankID is one of the more famous yeah. uh, two-factor authentication methods. I wonder how many of you who has enabled two-factor authentication on, on, on GitHub, 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 for instance, yeah. and we know. Have we looked at it? Uh, no, not this no, year. No, not this year. But we can, if we, as because we have an organi organization on GitHub and you are a member of that organization, we can see which of you who has entered two-factor authentication on GitHub. It's not uh, many of you, no, I'm sure. Uh, it's not that many. And mm. that is because for us as an organization, you are actually a risk if you haven't. Mm. So, so it's like a warning on our side that, oh, make sure to tell those users that they should enter two-factor authentication because you are a hazard for our organization, because you are more vulnerable, vulnerable than the ones that have, mm. has uh, activated two-factor authentication. So you can do this in, do this in many ways. Uh, one way is uh, SMS codes. Uh, you have probably seen that. If you log into a page, you will be sent an SMS code and you can enter that SMS code and you will be be, be uh, uh, cleared to that site. Uh, if possible, try to avoid SMS codes uh, uh, because that is a really hard single point of failure. There are many cases where uh, telephone numbers has been socially engineered over to, to, to other persons, to attackers. Mm. Uh, in many cases, mostly I think in the US, that, that actually attackers has just called the phone company told them a, a sad story about how they lose, lost the phone and they need to transfer this to another phone, yada yada, send a new SIM card, and they pick the SIM card from the mailbox and then they got your SMS codes as well. So, uh, And there are more sophisticated ways, even easier ways of doing that. Even. Mm. So, so, so try to avoid SMS codes if possible. Um, for instance, I think 
Twitter just changed. On Twitter, you can have SMS codes as one option and you can have uh, a two-factor authentication application. Uh, and that is what I recommend um, uh, as an option of two-factor authentication. However, you were not able to, to if you were to have a, a two-factor authentication application, uh, you were not able to disable SMS mm -hmm. verification. So you were still vulnerable to mm -hmm. that form of attacks. But since like last week, I think you can now disable SMS uh, uh, verification and only have the two-factor app authentication. And it's pretty simple. You just download an app. There is a standard concerning this. Uh, Google uh, has an app uh, and, and many of the uh, password managers has apps for this mm -hmm. as well. You just scan a barcode uh, and, and you, you will be, you will get numbers in that app uh, randomly generated. If you are using Steam, I think, no, not Steam. Uh, yeah, Steam. I don't remember some of the game platforms. Might be Blizzards actually. So they have their own authentication app that works the same way. Hopefully, as many as possible use the same uh, standard because that makes it uh, so much easier. But but you should enable two-factor authentication on all sites possible. Okay, it's 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 a little bit harder yep. because when you log in, you need not just to 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 sell, send your password. You also need to enter the two-factor authentication. Yeah, but it feels safer. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so, okay, and if you have two-factor authentication enabled, the the rule about having a really secure password is not that critical. I mean, you can have quite a simple password that you re remember, if you like, because you have the two-factor that, that, that adds the security to that. So, okay, the security, sec <laughs> the security starts with you, so what about the server then? Mm -hmm. Let's look at that. So, so now we, this was the user. Yeah. Let's transition to how we as developers sh should handle this on the server. Uh, First of all, as we said, handling and managing password is a risky and complex business. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see that by just looking at all of the uh, compromises that have happened over the years. Uh, yeah. Adobe, uh, uh, Sony, I mean, big, big tech companies that have lost uh, the users' credentials. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in clear text because they have probably not saved the passwords in clear text. However, they lose the database with the user email and together with the hash uh, of, of the password. Uh, we should never ever send passwords over HTTP. We should always use HTTPS and we will talk more about that later in the course. Um, and as I said, passwords should never, or pass phrases, we mm. should say, should never be stored in a, a, a clear text in the database. If you ever like go to a site and you have forgotten your password and, and you, you, you press like reclaim my password and you get an email with your password <laughs> back, then you should basically contact that uh, uh, service and tell them that they are handling things very wrong because they should never ever be able to, to read your password. The only f time they are able to see your password is when you send the password using a form to the server mm. for that. I mean, from you get the request on your server side until the user is validated. You, you can, of course, read the password, mm -hmm. but you should never ever be able to, you should never ever store that in clear text anywhere. Um, you should, and by ha, ha, the, the way you manage it is that is that instead of storing it in clear text, you hash the pass, password using a hashing algorithm. It's like an encryption, but it's a, a one way uh, yeah. encryption. So, uh, and there are hashing algorithms like Argon2, Bcrypt, Scrypt, uh, many more uh, uh, that does this for you. So it basically takes your clear text password, runs it through an algorithm and back you will get just a random string of, of, uh, of characters. Mm. Uh, the thing with the hashing algorithms is, is that as soon as, soon as you, 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 you send in, for instance, if you send in hello world, you will always get the same result back. Um, it's not like a random factor in this. It's always, if you send in hello world, you will always get the same text back. Um, uh, there are algorithm, algorithms that you should avoid, like MD5 is a really popular one when it comes to yeah. hashing passwords, but they have vulnerabilities. And that is because time has passed, computer, uh, power or 
computing power has mm. increased yeah. and those are now considered not safe anymore. Yeah. So try to avoid those that you see on this line. Uh, I think you should, as I said, since, since you're not storing the password in a database, I mean, even if, if you send in a password that is 300 characters to the hashing algorithm, the, the result is always, I think, what is it like a, a 32 character, 64 character? 64, 68, yeah, depends. Yeah, 64, 68 character uh, length that is stored in the database. So, so, so basically, if you're sending in more than 64 characters, they are not making the password more secure. So, uh, but, but you should, I mean, let the user decide its own password length. And if you're afraid of some kind of buffer overflows and uh, attacks, uh, if the user sends a password of gigabytes, then maybe set, set a limit to, to 2,000 characters then, or something, something in that vicinity. Um, let's look at of how this could look. So, so in this case, don't use MD5, but this is an example using MD5. Um, so there are, and this is actually because this is an example of, of, a, of a, a, a attack vector that is pretty common. Um, so of course, if you store the database in, if you store the password in clear text and the user get hold of the database, then all those users are screwed because they have your password. The attacker has your password. So if we were instead to just hash the password, it would be better. So we look at this one. This is a, a table from a database where we can, or it's not a table from the database, but it's the plain text password and it is its hash in MD5. Yeah. And if we store this MD5 hash in the database, it's a lot better than storing the password in clear text. However, first of all, we're using MD5, and that is not a good algorithm because we can actually uh, crack that one with, with a little time, but it, it's still better. Uh, however, there is a problem uh, in this case, and uh, yeah, and, and that is that we can use something called uh, rainbow tables or dictionary attacks. Uh, and the dictionary attack is that, I mean, since we know that many are using the same password on many mm. sites, and Actually, the, the most common password is probably password or password123 or mm. summer 2018, and those really common passwords. Since the MD5 is always, or the hashing algorithm is always constructing the same hash from the same plain text password, we can have dictionary dictionaries that we can compare the MD, MD5 hash from a leaked database to our rainbow table, and we can find all like hashed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hashes, for instance. And if we have like a million users on our database, there will be a lot of them having the same password as this usual uh, password lists. Uh, so it's actually not good enough nope. just hashing the password. Uh, we need to add something else to this mix. And the problem is that the plain text password is always generating the same same hash. Yeah. So we need to do something in the middle of this. Um, well, and it's behind me. <laughs> yeah, it's a called a salting <laughs> technique. <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to add a salt to the hash. Yeah. Uh, some people find that sentence really funny, but okay. Oh. <laughs> um, well, what, what is salting then? Yeah, salting is just adding, like, like we salt the food, we are <laughs> adding just a, a common ingredient to the mix and that makes all the difference. Yeah. Um, so we have the password hello and we add a salt. And this salt is something that we store in clear text in the database. Uh, in this case, we're adding 7BC3. Then we hash this and we get a hash that we can store in the database. And this hash, even though we are using a, the user is using hello, a really simple password that is available in every rainbow table you can find. Uh, this one, the, the real one, hello 7BC3, and its corresponding hash will not should probably be in a rainbow table because it's just some random string. So we are actually helping the user to choose a safer password. Yep. Uh, then we store in the database, we store the username, we store the salt, and, and, and you should probably use unique salts for every user. Uh, 
if you were to use the same salt for every user, uh, then you would be able to create a dictionary for your site. Uh, it will take, you can not use a generic uh, rainbow table, but you would be able to create a rainbow table specific for your site if, if your, your mm. passwords were leaked. So, so use uh, a, a personal salt for every user. And then they get a salted and hashed password saved as well. And this one will be really hard to crack because I mean mm. it, it's it's pretty random. Uh, now you can see that even though John and Mike is using ABC one two three, they get completely different hashes, and that's that's the point in this one. Uh, some would argue that you should use two salts. I think it's unnecessary, but uh, that you use one salt in the database and that you have an application salt as well that you add. But ah. But, uh, I don't know because often, of, I mean, of course, often it's it, it is the database that is being leaked. Uh, but if you are using different salts for every user, I mean, then they ha the attacker would have to create one dictionary for each user in this case. Mm. And uh, well, of course, if you had another salt in in, in the application, uh, and they don't get the application code and that salt, then they wouldn't be able to create. A dictionary for a single user, but, but creating dictionaries for single users is quite cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's enough with a salt in the database. This makes rainbow tables useless, um, and as I said, same password, different hashes. So that's that's it about authentication, I think. Yeah. Well, what about authorization then? Yeah. Um, this is the next step because now we can. Uh, do we explain how we? Well, later on. Okay, we will explain because it. From it, it, it depends on the. The uh, implementation. Yeah. Yeah, but I could just just briefly explain because. You might ask, but if we now have this hashed password, and we are not able to read it back, how can we compare this mm. to the user's password? And that's the beauty: is that if the user enters its credentials with the hello password, you do the same thing once again. You salt the user's password. In this case, you get hello, or you, in this case, you get ABC123 uh, JKL632. And then you, you, you run that through the hashing algorithm. And then you compare that result of the hash with the salt of the ha uh, with with the, the result of the hash that is stored in the database, and that's how you know that the user entered the correct mm -hmm. password. But you will never ever be able to get the password back for this user because it, it the the hashing algorithm makes that impossible. But we will look more in detail on this when we look on implementation. Okay, authorization then. Um, I mean, when we are creating resources on the web server, the, the user should not be able to, 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 to manipulate and read resources that it's not uh, authorized to do. Yep. And, and, and we need to, I mean, classical thing, you should not be able to look at, on a web shop, you should not be able to look at another user's uh, shopping list or, 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 mm. or, or cart re um, receipts or, or whatever. Um, and a re really important thing is that we cannot do solve this by like hiding things from the yeah. user on the client. Like, uh, well, there is no button for the user to click, so it will not, never ever be able to see the other user's information. But you must realize, you must count on that you attackers will try to like manipulate URLs. They will try to to, 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 to change the URL to, mm. to get access to another user. You cannot like hide, simply hide a delete button in an interface uh, if the user should not be able to delete the resource because, I mean, you can simply just create a custom post to the server mm. doing a delete. So, so, and you can unhide the button, I mean, if you hidden it with CSS. So, so never trust the client at all. We need to do all security on the server. Um, your authorization process should always, in a perfect world, prevent access to requested resources by default. What do you mean by that? Well, what it says. <laughs> uh, so, what to 
say about it then? Uh, well, when you create an application and you need to to authorize um, every request, well, you should always look at it as uh, you will restrict the, the the access to the requested resource. Yeah. And you said a perfect world, and, and that is well. <laughs> there are some 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 not some examples that you need to not do that. I guess yes, mm. you could say so. Mm. Uh, resource authentic authorization can be complex because it validates whatever or not, whether or not a user uh, uh, is allowed access to a specific resource. Um, And we will not look into that too much today, I no, think, no, how, how you val just validate no. the, if the user has access or not. Uh, well, there are two different kinds of authoriz authorization, uh, I, I, I think, we can identify with. It, by just looking at the URL, mm. for example, um, but, but if, we, if, we, if the user requests a resource in a database, for example, we will need to verify that the user has, uh, that we can, can grant access to use yes, this specific entity in the, in the, in the database. Yeah, by, by, by actually in, reading in, from the database yeah. and see if we have like a connection between this user and the yeah. resource. Yeah. Um, we will start looking, I guess, in more uh, more practical on how to do this, and we will mm -hmm. look off on how to do this in uh, an Express application in Node using MongoDB as a database and the Mongoose yep. as the schema uh, or uh, object relation mapper. So we can identify some uh, some important things we need to to do. Mm -hmm. So. We need to make sure that the username is unique. Yeah, of course. Uh, or at least, if we rely on the username as as the user unique, because the, something needs to be unique with the yeah. user. Well, I, Often, I, I, it's a username. It could be an email address. Well, as well. I, I, yeah, I call it a username. Yeah, yeah. But what what it could be an email address yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should. Yeah, this is this is the only thing we should do with a password. I think we should set the minimum length. Say mm. that okay, no less than ten characters is allowed. Mm. But don't set the maximum length. Don't do those stupid things with you need one capital letter, one uh, number, one mm. special mm. character, and three dashes. And uh, don't mm. just don't just. Tell the user what to do because if you if you provide that kind of information, the more information you provide, I mean, uh, after a while you will probably all users will have the same. I mean, if we do take that to the extreme, all users will have the same password <laughs> because it's only one password that will comply to all rules. So the lesser rules, the the, the larger the chance that you you get like a good randomness of mm. passwords. And and I mean. Of course, you can try to lecture the, your user into using good passwords, but do that by by like telling them that this password is good or bad, like with a with mm. a with a meter or something like that. Don't don't like force them into using different schemas. Um, I, I I've, I've even seen things like no, your password should consist of three starting numbers and then three letters. Mm. And I mean, then you okay, so you have six characters, and that is a pretty good password at least. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. But you narrow that down so that <laughs> an attacker knows that the first three is, is, is uh, numbers and the last three is uh, uh, characters, and then you have a lot less, lesser safe password. Well, I'm getting upset when I, <laughs> I, uh, because there are so many... Wow. Well, if you need to set the length, make it long. Yeah. Yeah. Thousand characters or whatever. A thousand or two thousand characters. That that shouldn't be a problem for your like in memory to handle before the hashing. But of course, if the user sends in a gigabyte of of, of uh, <laughs> uh, length, then okay, it might be a problem. Uh, also, make sure that you when 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 setting the, the the minimum length, do that on both client and the server. Don't rely on the client. You should never rely on the client on on validating that password. Uh, but 
please do validate it on the client as well because then your server don't need to, to like do a lot of validation before it's actually um, no, validate, required. Validation yeah. of the length you mean. Yeah, the yeah. length. So, 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 so let the user like uh, see a, 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 comp a direct feedback on the client if, if the password is too short. And as soon as the password is in the correct length, then the user will send it, be able to send it to the server. Um, let's see. I have. Uh, I need to speed up. I think. Uh, well, Salt and has the password yeah. using, and we will be using Bcrypt JS. JS, yes, uh, Bcrypt because because there are no dependencies. Yep. A bit slower than uh, Bcrypt that uh, is uh, written in C, I think. Okay. Yep. But doesn't matter. Uh, it's probably a good thing because slow when it comes, I mean, there is actually a factor when it comes to hashing algorithms that it's a good thing that they are slow because if they are slow, it will take more time to do a brute force. Well, uh, the applying the principle of separation of concern is a good idea by adding static methods to the Mungo schema to register users. And we will look on yeah. that, look, look what that means. So here we have a user schema. Uh, uh, or part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we will probably need to add more uh, profile information. But, but, but at least we have a username. Yeah. It's type string, it's required, and it's unique. Mm -hmm. So now we don't need to think about yeah. that part. That's about it. Yeah. We create a password, it's type string, it's mm -hmm. required, and it has a min minimum length of 10, and we have some custom message saying the password must be the minimum length of blah, 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 and yeah. I think that this will be shown later on. Uh, then we have a timestamp and things. And if we're using an email address as the username, so yeah. to speak, uh, we need to validate that as well. I yeah, think. as an email address. Yeah. Yep. And we have this validation thing we need to do, but let's forget yeah. about that for yeah. now. Uh, remember, this 10 characters, that is before sorting a hash. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. is what the user is, is, is providing us with. So starting to, to hash the password, we will use the uh, uh, bcrypt uh, JS. Uh, so we have probably included mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. and uh, installed it. And remember, uh, before uh, sorting, the, the validation of the length of the password is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we can use something called a prehook uh, on mm -hmm. the schema uh, that before we say basically use schema dot pre save. So before this is saved, we are doing something with with it. Yeah. Uh, in this case, we are providing a function, uh, and this is an uh, asynchronous function, and that is because the bcrypt, as I said, will probably take some time. Yeah. It's a quite costly operation to to, to hash something so we are just awaiting so we are leaving the queue uh, doing this it's not a synchronous call uh, so we are uh, we do a bcrypt.hash this dot password and mm -hmm. there are things to notice in this one yeah you cannot use in an arrow function for instance nope uh, and that's because the arrow function will rebind this uh, or actually the arrow function will do it so that uh, this mongoose library cannot rebind this, yeah. I would say, because the, mm. a narrow function cannot be rebound to another scope. Uh, and by using a regular function, uh, Mongoose is binding this to the actual uh, model. Mm. Uh, oh. or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, it says um, this dot password, then we get the password that the user provided, uh, and we do this. Well, that's that's uh, the you depth call of the, or, well, the cost. The cost of, of, of the hash. So the the larger the cost, the more energy or yeah. more process uh, resources will go into to generating this. Yes. And eight is okay, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can, well, some, you some, can probably some, debate that you yeah, should yeah. have higher is better, but higher, more costly. But, yeah. Some say twelve or even a larger number. Yeah. Well, and and the salt is auto-generated. Yeah. In this case. Yeah. And we save it back to the password model, yeah. and then it's set. Uh, the salt and the hash is auto-generated. We don't need to think about salting. We nope. don't need to think about hashing. It's all done with a hash. It's even salted. Yeah. Uh, but then we should have like this dot salt and save the salt. Or what is happening? 
Well, let's look at that because it's pretty pretty convenient for us. So so what what the bcrypt uh, function is returning is not just the hashed password. It's the hashed password to get with metadata. Well, it's uh, the hashed method that returns this string that contains some three different parts mm -hmm. or four even, but but three different fields. Um, well, we can find at the start the version, the cost, and the first, I think it is 22 characters or so, is the salt, and yeah. the, the rest is the. the yeah, yeah the, the, the cipher, cipher text, text or, yeah. or, or the hash. Yeah. Uh, and this is really convenient because then we just save this in the database and yeah. call it password, and the password will contain all information we need to, 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 to later on validate the, mm. the user's password. Uh, then the, we come to the next step, so the user will uh, try to log in. Well, it's we just register the user. Yeah. Well, and we need to log in the user. Yeah, so now we log in the user. The user submits a login form, credentials, as we said. Uh, we create a new session storage uh, co session cookie and stores the user data session and redirects. Uh, and this is if everything is okay. Yeah. So, so if if the if the user a hash compares, and we will look at that as well. If the authentication fails, we should give a four hundred one or mm. whatever we as we discussed earlier. Uh, And yeah, this one is actually quite interesting because many forget to have a logout button. You yeah. should able to be able to log out from the service and then kill the session cookie. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and redirect. Yeah. Uh, okay, looking at the authentication, uh, we we create in this case we have created uh, on the user schema we have created a static method called authenticate. Mm -hmm. uh, which is also a uh, asynchronous function because of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, finding something in the e database yeah. can take some time. Uh, we get the username and the password, this one. Then, first of all, we need to check, is this user a user in the database? Mm -hmm. Is it correct username? So, so if we're trying to find the username, uh, if we can't find the user or uh, uh, if, first of all, if we can't find the user, we are just throwing an error saying invalid login attempt. Mm. And we're also adding the uh, um, password handling in this case. Yeah. So we are trying, we are doing an await on bcrypt.compare instead of hash. Mm. And the compare method takes the password uh, in this case and it compares that to the user that we got from the database's password. And it's important that we do this after we try if we got a user, yeah. because if we didn't get a user, then this we don't need to do this at all. And uh, the compare method here is a constant time algorithm. Ah. So you can't oh, oh, do attacks to this and um, uh, yeah, constant, yeah, constant, constant. So, so it will always take the same amount of time. Yeah, you will not be able to figure things out because the algorithm is is fast or slow or something well, like that. It depends on the, yeah. the, the number of characters in yeah. the uh, in the password. Yeah. So, yeah. nope. Uh, and observe, even if the password is incorrect, we will yeah say invalid login attempt. Yeah. we will not. We will not even at this stage leak if it was the password or the username that was incorrect. And that is probably the best way because then, then mm. we don't risk somewhere down the line making uh, a difference between those two. Okie doke. And this is in the controller method. Yeah, so in the controller we have the login post, we get the request, uh, we and call we our authenticate, authenticate uh, uh, and method. And, and if everything went fine, we regenerate the session cookie. Yeah, that is and what it shows. If there are wrong credentials of some kind, well, we need to catch the error. Yeah. If we want to show a flash message on the login page. Mm. Authorized then, um, I mean, when defining the roots like router.post create, for instance, uh, we can add a uh, we can add methods. Yeah. 
uh, to 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 this one. So so so, and they will first of all, it will run the controller authorize. Yeah. If that one turns out okay, uh, it will. In, if we look in that one, it will call next. Yeah. And, and next, th this, is a, this is a, a middleware. Yeah. And in middlewares, you call next for the to continue the execution. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you if you in this way call next error, it will not continue nope. on the middleware path. It will continue with an error instead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the tricky part is here is in this if statement. You need to to to, to make the the check if the user is log uh, if the user is author authorized or not. Yeah. And this could be like checking in the database. It could be looking at the URL. It could be many different s s schemes of of of, of uh, authorization. In the this most uh, the, it's most easy part, I think, is to to verify if the user is logged on or not. Yeah. It's just. Uh, are there? Uh, yep. Is there any? Uh, is there a session cookie or not? So, yep. well, yep. that's if you have it. a session cookie, then next. Otherwise, yeah, throw an error. Yep. that's about it. Yeah, uh, well. we will uh, continue uh, with uh, a follow up and talking a little bit more on attack attack vectors and the common uh, web attacks uh, to to web applications mm -hmm. and how to mitigate those attacks. Um, <laughs> Like cross-site scripting, CSERF, and uh, mm. injection attacks are the most common one. When we will look at the OWASP uh, uh, list of, of of attack vectors for that, but that is for next time. So uh, good luck with the assignment.